The Birch Bark House by Louise Erdrich, a National Book Award finalist. The dedication page to Persia, whose song heals. Thanks and acknowledgments. My mother, Rita Gourneau Erdrich, and my sister, Lise Erdrich, researched our family life and found ancestors on both sides who lived on Madeline Island during the time in which this book is set. One of them was Gete Manaman, or Old Wild Rice. I'd like to thank him and all of his descendants, my extended family. The name Omakaeus appears on a Turtle Mountain census. I am using it in the original translation because I've been told those old names should be given life. The name is pronounced Omakaeus. The more accepted spelling and pronunciation of this name is Omakaeus. However, I decided to remain true to the name as it was pronounced and spelled in 1892. Dear reader, when you speak this name out loud, you will be honoring the life of an Ojibwa girl who lived long ago. This book and those that follow are an attempt to retrace my own family's history. Special thanks to Steve and Mary Gotherman and all of the devoted people at the Madeline Island Historical Society. Mom and Sister Angie, thanks for your constant encouragement with the illustrations. I would especially like to thank my daughter, Persia, who read this book when it was a manuscript and made important suggestions. Apajigo Matchwich, Winona Laduk, you started me thinking. All of my Ojibwa teachers, Nawagenis, Jim Clark, Jesse Clark, Dennis Jones, and Lorraine Jones, Keller Pop, Lisa LaRange, Apajigo Matchwich, all mistakes are mine. The Girl from Spirit Island The only person left alive on the island was a baby girl. The tired men who had come there to pick up furs from the Anishinaabe people stood uneasily on the rocky shore. The voyagers watched from a distance as the baby crawled in a circle, whimpering and pitiful. Her tiny dress of good blue wool was embroidered with white beads and ribbons, and her new moccasins were carefully sewn. It was clear she had been loved. It was also clear that the family who had loved her was gone. All of the fires in the village were cold. The dead lay sadly in blankets, curled as... as though sleeping. Smallpox had killed them all. The voyagers trembled at the thought that the disease might have already chosen one of them. Surely, they muttered, the baby had the sickness too. She's sick. She looks tired, said one man when she lay down against one of the blanketed figures. Let her sleep. Birds were singing. Dozens of tiny white-throated sparrows. The trilling, rippling sweetness of their songs contrasted strangely with the silent horror below. First one, then the other of the men turned away. They got back into their canoes. As they paddled toward the next island, all were silent. Some were hard expressions. One man had tears in his eyes. His name was Hat. He thought of his wife and decided he would tell her about the baby. If there was anyone in the world who'd go and rescue that little girl, it was his wife. He shivered a little as he thought of her. He couldn't help it. Tallow, she was called, and sometimes she scared him with her temper. Other times, he was amazed at her courage. He grimaced in shame. Unlike him, his wife was afraid of nothing. The first section is called Nebin, Summer. Chapter 1, The Birch Bark House. She was named Omakaeus, or Little Frog, because her first step was a hop. She grew into a nimble young girl of seven winters, a thoughtful girl with shining brown eyes and a wide grin. 
only missing two of her top front teeth. She touched her upper lip. She still wasn't used to those teeth gone and was impatient for the new grown-up teeth to complete her smile. Just like her namesake, Omakaeus now stared long at the silky patch of bog before she gathered herself and jumped. One hummet. Safety. Omakaeus sprang wide again. This time she landed on the very tip-top of a pointed old stump. She balanced there, looking all around. The lagoon water moved in sparkling crescents. Thick swalls of swamp grass rimpled. Mud turtles napped in the sun. The world was so calm that Omakaeus could hear herself blink. Only the sweet call of a solitary white-throated sparrow pierced the cool of the woods beyond. All of a sudden, Grandma yelled, I found it! Startled, Omakaeus slipped and spun her arms and wheels. She teetered, but somehow kept her balance. Two big, skipping hops, another leap, and she was on dry land. She stepped over spongy leaves and moss into the woods where the sparrows sang nesting songs in delicate relays. Where are you? Nokomis yelled again. I found the tree. I'm coming, Omakaeus called back to her grandmother. It was spring. Time to cut the birch bark. All winter long, Omakaeus' family lived in a cabin of sweet-scented cedar at the edge of the village of La Pointe, on an island in Lake Superior that her people called Maningwanakaning Island, or Island of the Golden-Breasted Woodpecker. As soon as the earth warmed, the birch bark house always took shape under Nokomis's swift hands. Now the dappled light of tiny new leaves moved on Grandma's beautifully, softly lined face. In one hand, she waved her sharp knife, taken from the beaded pouch on her hip. In the other hand, she held tobacco. Nokomis was ready to make an offering to the spirits, or manitows. They love tobacco. Omakaeus banged the tree her grandmother had found. Yes, here, here it is, this one. Omakaeus was skinny, wiry, and tough for seven winters. She slammed the trunk of the birch with a big rotten stick. Splinters of soft wood flew. Booney, Nokomis scolded. Leave it alone. She walked up to the tree and put her leathery paw-like hands on the smooth bark, feeling for flaws. Yes, she decided, her eyes sparkling at her granddaughter. A good one. Is it ready? Gay yet, said Nokomis, surely. Nokomis's tobacco pouch was decorated with blue and white beads in the shape of a pipe. She had owned this tobacco bag ever since Omakaeus could remember. When she talked to the manitows, Nokomis dipped out a pinch of tobacco. Old sister, she said to the birch bark tree, we need your skin for our shelter. At the base of the tree, Nokomis left her offering, sweet and fragrant. Then she peered closely, deciding just where to make the first cut. Suddenly, she pressed her razor-sharp knife into the bark. Omakaeus stepped back. Light filtered golden and green onto their faces. Tiny white flowers poked out of dead leaves. There were still traces of grainy old snowbanks in the shadiest spots, but in places the sun was actually hot. Pow! As soon as Grandma made the proper cuts, the birch bark, filled with spring water, nearly burst from the tree. Omakaeus helped her grandmother carefully push the bark aside. Then the two peeled away the stri- it away strip by strip. She and Omakaeus carried the light, papery, pink-brown rolls out of the woods, down a trail to the special place near the water. Here they set up the birch bark house. Damp ground made Nokomis' old bones ache, so she spread out her brown cat-tail mat and sat down there to sew those pieces of bark together. 
Omakeus helped her, threading the tough basswood strands through the holes punched by Grandma's awl. Meanwhile, Mama and Omakeus' older sister tied together a frame of bent willow poles. Finally, as the light faded, they fastened the mats of bark onto the willow frame, a half-skeleton of pliable saplings. The bark mats overlapped like shingles to shed the rain. Each one was secured to the next so as not to blow off in a storm. When the house was swept out, smoothed, fussily arranged, and admired, they moved in. The children, Omakeus' brother, Little Pinch, Baby Nemo, Omakeus' older sister, Pretty Angeline, and Omakeus herself spread their blankets around the stone fire pit. Mama and Nokomis hung the smoky woven bags of rice and tools and medicines from the willow poles above. Omakeus' family were Anishinaabe, and this was their island. Her father, her day day, was in the fur trade business, which meant that he was often gone, paddling the great canoes for the fur company, or sometimes trapping animals himself. Yellow Kettle, her mother, was quick-tempered, but always laughing, and her eyes shrewdly took in the world. Yellow Kettle was a strong-looking woman, and beautiful. Her smile was generous, enigmatic, and slightly crooked, and kind. She missed nothing when it came to her children. It was impossible to hide a half-done job, ridiculous even to think of sneaking away in the morning before gathering wood for the fire and water for her cooking pot. And if Mama didn't notice the younger children's whereabouts, Omakeus' older sister, Angeline, surely would. Angeline was smart and so pretty, people turned in their tracks to stare at her. Her hair was thick and her hands clever. The beads in her designs were laid down in strict rows. Her stitches never faltered. Her steps, when she walked or danced, were clear and graceful. She was so perfect that Omakeus despaired. Still, she hoped that she herself would turn out like Angeline, and was embarrassed to find herself following at Angeline's heels like a puppy. Most of the time, Angeline was kind to Omakeus and let her tag along and admire from a distance. But there were also times her words were sharp as bee stings, and at those times Omakeus shed tears her sister never knew or probably even cared about. For as beautiful as very beautiful people sometimes are, Angeline could be just a little cold-hearted at times. Omakeus' little brother Pinch was the only real big problem in her life. The sad truth was, and she couldn't tell this to a single person, Omakeus didn't like little Pinch. She thought there was something wrong with him. So greedy, so loud. But although his ways were mischievous and bold, Pinch loved his mother deeply, and he clung to her side. In fact, he took up all her attention, even more than the baby. He clutched Mama's skirts with fat, tough little fingers. He yelled at Omakeus if she was slow in giving up her willow doll, her little rock people, or anything else for that matter, including food. Special pieces of driftwood she found, even her favorite sleeping place near Grandma. He thought he deserved everything. At least, when it came to Niwo, there was nothing to complain about. He was so sweet that Omakeus often pretended that he were, was her very own baby. Of course, she hardly ever got to hold him, for he was still very young. Still, she was sure he preferred her to Angeline, and certainly to Pinch. Sometimes he even held his arms out to her when Mama was holding him, and yelled with delight when Omakeus picked him up. 